I'm going to talk about um, songs. And uh, first I'm going to talk about some of the criteria for choosing songs. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about um, how you use songs in the classroom, how you teach songs, how you create materials for songs in the classroom. First, it, it's probably an obvious criteria, but can you hear the words? Uh, it might be a fantastic song. The artist might be the greatest artist there is in the world. But if you can't hear the words, and if you can't hear them clearly enough um, because of either the enunciation of the words or because the way it's the song is mixed, then uh, it's kind of hard to do it. It's too much of a cognitive load. That's John Lee Hucker, one of my favorite blues singers. And um, it's hard to hear what he's saying most of the time. And that perhaps is why I liked him so much. But it has to be clear to give students a chance to work with the language and to let their cognitive processes begin to decode the message. Two, is there anything that could be offensive to students, sexual, racist, um, sexist, or uh, religious? Um, I th when I see that picture of Eminem, I'm always usually pretty well repulsed. Maybe I don't understand him as an artist, and I'm willing to be convinced, but it's not the kind of songs I would think would be appropriate in a classroom. Of course, it depends on who your students are, and it depends on who, what their interests are, but we need to be careful, especially these days, in terms of the explicit nature of a lot of popular music. Three. Um, does the song use too much specialized lexis or slang? This is the kind of thing that is similar to a reading comprehension. So um, we don't want to submit our students to um, a, a lot of vocabulary which is very hard to understand. Uh, take, for example, Progal Haram's um, song from about 60,000 years ago. A whiter shade of pale. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just a series of kind of interesting images, but that's tough for a student to try and make sense of. Four. Um, it's often a great idea to choose songs that um, tell stories. Um, and these stories can often lead into role plays. For example, She's Leaving Home. Uh, we can have a, say, a courtroom situation where we have the um, social worker, we have the parents, we have uh, the girl herself, and we can begin to try and understand why she left home. Similarly with David Bowie's um, Space Oddity. What happened to Major Tom? Did he have some kind of breakdown, nervous breakdown? Was he having problems with his wife? Uh, just what happened up there in space? Five, um, songs that have a lot of lyrics, like ballads and probably like a lot of um, hip, -hop, hip hop music, uh, are kind of too much. Uh, and you might want to think of treating them as reading rather than listening, and maybe adding on the listening later. Um, that's a song by um, Bob Dylan about Hurricane um, Reuben Carter and uh, his. Uh, the way he was treated very wrongly uh, and the injustices he suffered. Great song, but it goes on and on and on, verse after verse after verse. Um, a little too much. You could concentrate on the first couple of verses and then give the rest as a reading for homework. Um, six, don't be too cool. We often identify ourselves through the music we listen to. Remember the movie High Fidelity and how that particular character judged people by the music they listened to. Um, a lot of great songs to 
to use in the classroom may, be not, may not be songs that you particularly like or think are hip. But no one's judging you and your identity by them. If they work in the classroom, use them. Here's a classic song from a long time ago. Uh, Barbara Streisand in Donna Summer, uh, No More Tears. It uh, starts off very slow, then goes into a disco beat. Uh, it was very popular at the time. Um, people loved it. The slow part is great to use for dictation. And um, I didn't particularly like it, but it, it worked. And I have to say, poor Donna Summer, why would you ever want to sing next to Barbara Streisand? Or try to sing, or try to compete, or compare yourself with Barbara Streisand. Seven, um, have the students heard the song before? If they have, of course, that's a big plus. It's a big advantage uh, because they already like that music. It's something they want to listen to. So they're highly motivated, and they probably understand quite a bit of the song already. Um, we are the champions. Uh, yeah, I think everybody knows that one. And um, so... Um, there's a lot of interest there, so you can build upon the interest. Um, juxtaposing that with that obscure album that you really, really dig, uh, you love it, but no one else has heard about it, well, mm -hmm. uh, just be circumspect with playing that in the classroom, because the students may not be as thrilled as you are. Um, a problem often arises when students bring their own songs to the classroom. Um, <clears throat> be careful. Um, be careful um, because, as we've said before, it's not always easy to understand songs. Songs can be very difficult. So you don't want to put yourself in an embarrassing situation where you're saying, well, I, I, just, I can't hear it. I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what it means. Um, there's one example. Uh, a student might bring this to class. Most of it's in Korean, but there's a bit of English mixed in there, too. You wouldn't want to try to have to work with that song. Um, you also have a choice um, these days, with the fabulous resource of YouTube, of using the audio or the video version, or using a combination of both. Um, but be careful. I'll talk about, I'm going to talk about the relationship between images and the spoken text or sung text in the case of songs in um, the uh, lecture about using TV news. And the basic argument I use there is that those kinds of visual texts that support the spoken text, which allow you to understand something of the spoken text, are the most useful. If you go on YouTube and you look for <clears throat> Susan Vega's Tom's Diner. There's a whole slew of choices you've got. Uh, many just have a picture, one picture, and that you can listen to the song. There is also um, one which is fabulous video with full of fantastic dancing and fantastic beautiful images. Um, and I think it's called the official uh, YouTube Susan Vega Tom Diner, Tom's Diner um, video. But yeah, the pictures, the images, have nothing to do with the song. They're pretty, but it's like wallpaper. And in that sense, they can be highly distracting to watch pictures, pretty pictures, which really don't have much to do with the song. If you keep searching on YouTube, you'll eventually find um, the link that I put there, which is a really neat little video. It was done as a student project, movie project, and what they have done is used Susan Vega's Tom's Diner as the soundtrack to a little movie. And in the movie, uh, it acts out the kinds of things which are described in the song. So um, here you have a perfect uh, choice of material because the, this particular vi video supports the song really well. Um, and so you can start, for example, by turning the sound down showing the video, and then eliciting the vocabulary from the students. And then, once they've got their vocabulary, and they have an idea of something of what the song is about, 
you can take the pictures away and let them listen to the audio or let them listen to the what listen and watch the video too so that is the one I, the link there is an ideal video to use with that song okay now we're going to talk about <clears throat> using songs and again we're going to use our framework of pre-task in task and post task. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about, in this, I'm going to use an example of a song called Our House by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and maybe Young, I forget. <clears throat> um, so the first thing we're going to do is, is contextualize it, and uh, we'll probably pre teach a little bit of vocabulary. Uh, maybe we'll use a, uh, some personalization, um, get students to talk about their house and what they like about it. Um, I've got a picture there which we could use to suggest something about um, homes and uh, what people like about them. Um, <clears throat> also in a pre-task, what I've um, uh, done here, uh, the particular song Our House, and you, you can listen to it um, I've got an MP3 of it um, in this folder. It, dis it describes a picture, and in this picture, there is the person um, who sings the song. I'm staring at the fire. Uh, and there's a vase with flowers in it. There's a fireplace, and um, I'm staring at the fire while I listen to you play your love songs. Uh, with two cats in the yard looking through the window. So I can use that to elicit a lot of vocabulary and give an image, a visual image, that students, once they listen, can begin to attach the words and language to. Okay, so once we've set it up, we can go to the end test. Now, this particular song... Um, is um, ideally suited um, for a little bit of dictation. But before we do that, uh, what I suggest is um, starting with some extensive listening, play the song and ask students to write down any words or phrases they hear. Anything. It doesn't have to be complete sentences, just a word or um, a phrase. And because this uh, is pretty slow, and clear, you can actually start off by playing the song as a dictation and do about four or five lines. You don't want to do too much, or the students are going to be uh, overworked and overstressed, but just enough to stretch them, just to show them that they can get at a lot of language in this song. Uh, when you're doing this, you can point out all the interesting phonological features, um, the kinds of um, rules of fast speech, um, elision and liaison, um, think of words like the pronunciation of the, of the word because comes out, cause. You can also focus on grammar. Uh, one of the lines is, life used to be so hard, so you could have a look at um, used to. Uh, and then, after you've done that, then you can go on to the classic um, uh, gap filler. Um, when you're doing gap fillers, you can focus on particular types of words. Um, often it's easier to give the beginning of the sentence and then leave a gap um, later on. Um, and you can focus on content words, um, and um, that makes it perhaps a little easier um, to um, for the, the gap filler. You can also use banks, of course where you have a bank of words and then you put the words in, you can use multiple choice words as well. Okay, so um, uh, that's the complete text, which people like to, to read the whole lyrics, so eventually, towards the end of the lesson, you're probably going to give the, the whole um, set of lyrics. Um, finally, in the post-task, you're going to exploit your song. For example, uh, this is a song written by Graham Nash and supposedly written um, to his then wife, Joni Mitchell. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Uh, they did break up. Why did they break up? So here we have a motivation to surf the web, to do some reading, to find out about their relationship. That's a cute picture. Um, uh, some speaking. You can, for example, draw a picture of your own ideal cozy room and then describe it to your partner. 
Uh, we could go to writing uh, for homework. Describe your ideal cozy room. Um, and pronunciation. We can keep revisiting this song in the future, which is great. I mean, they want to hear it again. Always bring back all this stuff. Uh, you can do it in the last five minutes. And you can always, again, point out particular new features of pronunciation that you didn't look at before.